then um, okay, on, the, on the notion of contact and time with Sure. Uh, I mean, in a Newtonian sense of time, that would be almost uh, nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. So I, the question I wanted to, to ask you was, if, you, if using your theory of time, and uh, uh, the biology of brain tubulins mm -hmm. and um, the quantum physics of superposition, mm -hmm. bringing those together yeah. as you were beginning to. Yeah. Um, how could you use that to explain psychedelic experience? Okay. Um, could you repeat? I, I missed the yeah. last phrase. Okay. Sure, I'll repeat it for you. Uh, uh, how, he was asking how I could use it to explain non-ordinary experiences of time. I see. Such a psychedelic experience. I see. Um, okay. And so I can, well, I could bring up an image, but it's on the wrong computer. Um, but, okay, so this model right here. So Roger Penrose says, okay, quantum processes are at the root of how our brain works. We've looked down to, we see the neurons and the neurotransmitters and all these different things that we look at when we try to figure out what our brain is doing. Um, but we can look even deeper. Within the neurons, there's a... a, a cytoskeleton, right, that kind of gives the neuron structure. And each of the little filaments of the cytoskeleton is made up of a column of 13 tubulin, like layered like bricks. And the tubulin are little proteins, and they change shape. And so this, uh, it's called a microtubule, that, that the, tub the tubulin makes up microtubules that make up the cytoskeleton of the neuron, and of all cells. Uh, but specifically in neurons, when somebody is given anesthesia, these little proteins that make up these little tubes quit changing shape. And so this is the contribution of Stuart Hameroff, who's an anesthesiologist, who saw that Penrose was looking for a quantum model of, of consciousness and says, okay, well, here's one place that uh, those two might be able to interface. It's a very small part of the brain, you know, on the very smallest levels. And it's something that could be used, people have looked at to use as a bit system in the brain. Like if a little protein could be, you know, in this shape or in this shape, it could be a one or a zero. But even if it's a one or a zero, that doesn't give us enough computational power to give us what the brain does. When you add up all of those, you know, tubulins and neurons in the brain, like it, even that does not give us enough computational power. But if we consider it as a, a qubit system where it can be either a one or a zero or in a superposition of those two possibilities, then we have enough computing power to get closer to what the brain does. Um, and additionally, Penrose says we have that, uh, that contacting of timelessness that happens with the superposition. And to interface with Natal's theory, it's, the, it's that wave function that is in, in encapsulating all the possibilities of particle paths of fractal particle paths um, that are embedded. Uh, and so Penrose's theory is you can have, so not only are these tubulins in superposition themselves, but they can be coordinated with other tubulins. So just like neurons in the brain coordinate with each other, um, these little tubulins can coordinate with each other and to coordinate neurons at a larger level. And he says it's when you get massive amounts of tubulin in superposition at the same time that you can experience the state of superposition in, in a sort of indecision. You have two potential choices you can have, just like a, a, a particle in superposition, a protein in superposition can be in a one or a zero, right? If you're trying to decide what you're gonna order at a restaurant, peanut butter and jelly or tuna fish, you can be in a superposition. You're kind of like weighing both of those options and then the waiter comes and takes a measurement and you have to choose one or the other. Penrose says you don't have to wait for the waiter to come to take a measurement. You can, uh, if a system is in superposition and there's no measurement coming, then it will collapse itself. He postulates, you know, he doesn't, he says, well, maybe it's a space-time separation as those two possibilities pull away from each other than their quantum gravity, which we don't have a complete theory of. He's just pot speculating that if they pull away, then their quantum gravity will slap, slap, snap them back into one position or the other. Um, so left to its own devices. And so he's saying that this self-collapse of the wave function um, happens in the brain because this, if it's a very small particle, this can go on for a very long time before it has to choose one. If it's larger, 
if it has more mass, then it's going to happen much faster. And so he says that as we, whoops, so that brings me to this graph, which is the number of tubulins in superposition. So as you get more and more tubulin in superposition, you're going to reach a conscious threshold where self-collapse is going to occur for all of those correlated uh, tubulin and they'll all collapse into one state or another, which is synonymous, not synonymous, analogous to a decision. Um, and so that's what this wave function is here. Okay, so then they go on to relate that to altered states of consciousness um, by saying, okay, well, if this is our, our normal way of, well, let's see, let me back up for a second. So within a cell or within these tubulin, there's a little hydrophobic packet in the middle, which is uh, to, shows the protein how to change shape based on van der Waal forces. Uh, van der Waal forces are like negative and positive and how those relate to each other. And it goes down to the particulate level such that if you have a proton and an electron circling, circling that proton, if the electron's over here and the proton's over here, here's your positive charge of that atom, here's your negative charge. When it changes place, then your negative charge is over here, your positive charge is over here. So this is on very fast time scales that these, that these uh, little hydrophobic packets are changing positions with relation to each other based on how those electrons are zooming around and the polarity of that atom is changing. In relation to the other atoms, it's changing their geometry, which is changing the shape of the protein. Um, so, psychedelics, um, well, let's see, and I might mess this one up a little bit, uh, but it has to do, okay, psychedelics are also high, high, hydrophobic, which, sorry, I didn't explain that word, but it's basically like olive oil. Doesn't, it's not water soluble. It's afraid of water, hydrophobic. Um, and so, psychedelics, which are oil soluble, the closer they are to olive oil, solubility, the more effective they are at reaching these hydrophobic packets and affecting their rate of change. Uh, and so the theory is that the uh, that they can be in superposition for longer uh, and faster so that it comes up. So if this is our pre-conscious processing right here um, up until this collapse and um, so that this is and I wish I had the graphic with me so I could go into that but it's on the wrong computer um, anyhow so sleeping they're making this much longer and slower and it comes to self collapse by being a longer curve and so it's staying in superposition for a longer time um, in with psychedelics, I believe, if I remember correctly, the chart is up here like this. So the, the frequency is increased and the number of tubulin uh, in superposition are increased, but it's for shorter amounts of time. And so it is, um, you're contacting the state of timelessness in a more 